Hello everybody, the Army of Light Earth Division, the badass boots on the ground. It's Shauna L. Francis and today is September 24th, 2024, officially into fall. It's here guys, the last few months of the year. How's everybody doing? Thanks so much for being here. We are decoding the living word. This is our ninth episode of this series with Melchizedek who helped shape, form, and write a lot of what's in the Bible. So it's so amazing that we get to sit down with these beautiful beings and hear really what was the intention? Where did things get misconstrued? Where are things just plain wrong? Um, obviously, we, uh, we've we covered a lot of ground here and we see a theme happening here. We see um, you know, these ideas that some of what was written in the Bible, the original intentions were double entendres, double meanings, a meaning for historical context and a meaning for now with the ascension. Today, Melchizedek wants to talk about what is God? Who is God? What does this mean? And um, I've got a pretty lengthy channeling from them um, on God. And they want me to read specifically Exodus chapter 33. And um, because this kind of gives you a good idea of kind of all the contradictions of how God is portrayed in the scripture. So I'm going to read through that. Um, how's everybody doing? <laughs> this is our ninth episode of Decoding the Living Word, the ninth episode. So we're quite a ways into it. We've learned about Adam and Eve and the serpent. And what does that really mean? We've talked about Noah. We've talked about Genesis in general. We've talked about um, who is Moses. We've talked about um, animal rituals and sacrifices that are so prevalent throughout scripture. So it's been quite an amazing journey. Um, feeling better today than I was last week. We got a head start on this. Things flowed more smoothly. And gosh, it, it's actually almost only 11 p.m. instead of midnight or 1 a.m. Uh, so feeling pretty good about this. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, dive in. Um, and again, I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your comments and for subscribing. Thanks to all the newbies here who are watching. There's so much to go through, but really, this is about the ascension. It is about the negative reptilian regime's stronghold on this planet. We are playing the role of helping to seed consciousness with this information. And everything that we're talking about with the Bible relates back to this in some way, shape, or form. So even though it might be, you know, something that doesn't interest you, um, it certainly is germane to what we're going through right now and all kinds of lessons to be applied for today's teachings, today's audience. All right, so we're going to get back into Exodus and I'm going to read chapter 33 here for you all. <clears throat> um, I might skip over a few sentences just to keep it brief, but um, then we'll get into the channeling. All right. The Lord, okay, the context here is right before this. Um, if you remember from last week's video, the Israelites had, Moses had gone up into the mountains to commune with God and the Israelites, while he was gone, made a false idol made of gold, of a golden calf, and they were um, worshiping this calf. And Moses comes back down the mountain and sees that they've been worshiping this false idol, this false god, and this was really seen as a big sin in the story. And in fact, um, according to this, you know, chapter 32 here, God had the, the men who were um, still um, beholden to God go and slay 3,000 people uh, as part of the Israelites for having sinned so greatly against God. All right, so that's the setting right before this here at 33. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go hence, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it, and I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land of flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you in the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man put on his ornaments, 
for the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now put off your ornaments from you, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent up and pitch it outside the camp far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose up, and every man stood at his tent door and looked after Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the door of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of of cloud standing at the door of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship every man at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, thou thou sayest to me, Bring up this people, but thou hast not let me know whom you wilt send with me. Yet thou hast, thou hast said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thy sight, show me now thy ways, that I may know thee and find favor in thy sight. Consider, too, that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if thy presence will not go with me, do not carry us up from here. For how, how shall it be known that I have found favor in thy sight? And I and thy people, is it not in thy going with us so that we are distinct? I and thy people from all other people that are upon the face of the earth. Verse 17. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my eyes, in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, I pray thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy upon who I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand upon the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. All right, and then that gets to 34 here. All right, so that's pretty long-winded, but you can see how God was all over the place here, and um, Melchizedek wants to talk about God in this context. Okay. Here's Melchizedek. Here we have, once again, a conglomeration of many ideas placed into a seemingly cohesive chapter. Moses, as we talked about previously, was a channel. Moses did have the gift of being able to communicate with the likes of the order of Melchizedek and other highly evolved beings of light. Moses was a shepherd to the people. Moses carried a torch. A torch. He was an intermediary, an emissary. Here we see that Moses asked God if he could please reconsider not accompanying the Israelites to the new land. Could God not show mercy and walk with them on this passage? And God said, yes, I will do this. What we'd like to talk about today, many of you have been asking out loud through these comments or to yourselves as you listen to these channelings, or even as you yourself has read your Bible sometime during your lifetime, who is God in this context? 
What does God represent? Think of all the different forms of God mentioned in the Bible and other holy texts in circulation today on the planet. It's a maelstrom of contradiction, volatility, repentance, forgiveness, judgment, guidance, nurturing, fear, and love. This keeps you all very much on your toes, does it not? While it will not be possible for us to explain all the iterations of God as represented here in the Bible, the many versions of the Bible and other holy texts, we would like to set the record straight from Melchizedek's perspective on a few key points. All right. And they say here, God is not your savior. We are sorry to bring you this news so bluntly. It is such a well-formed, well-loved, and widely accepted phrase that has created an entire belief system that puts God in this position of saving. Saving you personally, saving the chosen ones, saving particular nations, saving particular races, saving particular species. What does this mean to be a savior? Dear ones, it's just a word. And with most words in most languages, all that this word represents and encapsulates makes it difficult to even wrangle this expression down to something representing universal truth. Mouthful. May continue here. God is not a force that has the ability to be anyone's or anything's savior. However, what you can now understand and, and re-know from this historical line of thinking is that there's nothing to be saved. And you may say, well, wait a minute. We have this negative reptilian regime who is subjugating us who has been causing so much pain and suffering here, surely we must be saved from this tyranny. And we say to you, the antidote to this very challenging situation is that you who hear these messages, you who are awakening to the truth of such things, it's that you understand you are of source. You are of God. It's the collective consciousness, the I am presence, the unity of all things that gets lost here on earth that is now ready to be remembered. They say here, you are the Godhead, dear friends. And of course, you've never been taught this. What kind of blasphemy is that statement? What kind of attitude does that person have? Talk about arrogance with the big roll of the eyes. The sooner each of you can understand and grasp this concept, that you as singularities, individuated here into these beautiful bodies and expressions on earth, are magnificently and deliberately awakening to this higher truth. Excuse me. Now, you may not want to go around to your neighbors telling everyone, hey, I'm the Godhead, and you are too. At least not yet. <laughs> so we do this for you, dear ones. We can be the ones to enlighten you to this fact. And Melchizedek continues here. We see you in truth. We know who you are in truth. We know what you are in truth. And in the seeing, there is the knowing. And in the knowing, there are choices. God may not be your savior because that implies that something outside of you is going to come and rescue you. You get the glory of rescue, rescuing yourselves, dear ones. And it is the only way this is going to be possible. Yeah, this is very much in alignment with um, what the Galactic Federation of Light talked about um, for all those years um, as I was 
first channeling them when I started this channel, this YouTube channel. Really, this is not a rescue mission. We have chosen this. We are ascending as a species. This is taking, it's requiring that we raise our consciousness. We increase our fields, our frequencies. We embrace love and light. We work through this density and we have a reckoning with what's been going on here. Um, and, you know, this is trying to tie all of these concepts together. We are the Godhead. We are of source. We are all unified in this way as well. And they continue here. If you could only see what we see and comprehend what we comprehend, we follow the lines of thought and the thinking from generation to generation. We, as your guides, gently nurture the bits and pieces of your consciousness that are ready to know. And lest we skip too far ahead in the process and potentially derail what progress has been made around consciousness for these new ideas, we continue to gently nurture these budding seeds of knowing, these sparks that are not now growing and beginning to burn more fully. Remember, dear ones, that you are clearing the pathway here for the larger consciousness on this planet and beyond. No big deal. We've got this. All right. They continue. Let us all sit with this awareness that we are all of source. We all are contained within this immense sea of consciousness. As all your adversaries are, the ones who you would deem as not being worthy, the ones who are from a country that wars with your country, the ones who don't vote the way that you vote, those who steal and rape and pillage, those who have stoned you, those who have done you wrong, those who have hurt your feelings, those who don't understand you and never will. Yes, dear ones, even the negative reptilians and their allies are of the same source. Now, within this source consciousness, this Godhead framework, there are all levels of dark and light consciousness. All fall within God's purview. No one is excluded. And just like this dear one who sits before you, redemption is possible for all who want it. It may take several lifetimes, but it's possible. <laughs> okay. Then they continue here. Let us talk about redemption. Who is redeeming who? The archaic way of understanding redemption precludes one from knowing redemption in today's ascending world. Redemption, dear ones, related to being saved, restoring of something that has been lost, gaining favor in God's eyes where once there was no favor. Let us set a new tone for this word redemption. Let us set a new frequency. Let us feed consciousness with a new idea. Redemption in the here and now can be regarded as the act of working on one's own behalf to be the one who decides what within this more personal expression could benefit from more light. Let me rephrase that, paraphrase it. Redemption really can be seen as what do I decide? What has my oversoul decided? What does my small self decide? Could, could, where could I benefit from having more light? in this personal expression. And in this context, they continue, we'd say this is synonymous with more love. The natural progression for any soul is one of evolution, evolution to more and more expanded consciousness, more and more capacity for light, more capacity and embodiment of love. 
the ability to not deny di the divinity in others, but to know yourselves in unity at the most basic of levels. There may be aspects of your expression you feel could benefit from moving to denser, darker manifestations, an outpicturing of personality, if you will, to the more lighter, more unified, expanded approach. This is extremely simplified, but we wish to give you a foundational understanding of the context of which we speak. All right, Team Redemption, what is this? Personal evolution, going from more dense to more light. And Melchizedek continues here. It does you no good to place the power of redemption or the ability to be saved outside of one's own purview. You do best to regard these concepts as of your making. The divine self who wishes to be in expression that part of you who can dance between you, the small self, the 3D self, having a very human experience with all of its forgetfulness, and your experience as a multidimensional being of everlasting light, the Godhead, allows for this realization. Okay. A major part of the lifting of this plane of consciousness is the realization that God is self. God is all things, all that you can see, smell, taste, and touch, all that you can imagine, all that you've experienced, all that you may experience are part, are part of God's creation. The small self, primarily driven by ego, who may want to keep you from knowing yourself as divine, has done an excellent job of keeping order and predictability through separate separateness and self-righteousness. <laughs> wow. I mean, those are pretty strong words here. The small self primarily driven by ego really wants to keep things the way they've always been. It kind of keeps us in the past and keeps us in our routines and keeps us in our old ways of thinking. Um, knowing ourselves as God, knowing ourselves as unified in consciousness with all of existence. Um, you know, that's scary to the ego that protects the small self, that keeps us feeling separate, that keeps us, um, you know, safe and comfortable and in, in a world that is less chaotic and more predictable. It's just giving us a context here for really how to make this life work for us. And always they say the ego's done an excellent job of helping us keep our acts together here. Um, if it weren't for the ego, we would be, you know, this would be a very chaotic realm of existence. So it's not about shunning the ego. It is about realizing that now we can evolve kind of out of that way of being and letting the ego lead. And even as I say these words, it's like, okay, well, how do we do that? And, and what Melchizedek is saying is, let's just kind of sit with the knowing right now. Let's just not try to figure out how to do it or what that might might look like or really feel like or how we might execute on this. Let's just be sitting with the knowledge right now that we are of God, we are of source. And we have been letting the ego control our worlds for good reason, but now it's time for a new paradigm. Unity consciousness that dissolves the ego, that allows for a more expanded view of our brothers and sisters and where we all fit together and how we all interact with each other and how this world interplays um, between all these consciousnesses and how truly it is all one big pool of existence. Um, so <laughs> yeah, moving into this new paradigm where we are divine and everyone is known as divine, it's scary for the ego. And we want to, you know, we, we're, we're a little bit um, trepidatious about just diving in. And I think we've come a long way in a couple of years. I know I have in terms of really knowing this and feeling this and, and having a level of comfort with it that hasn't been there before. And I think we're going to start seeing this more and more in the collective. All right. So they continue here. Now that the ego is faced with a completely changed paradigm of what it has known, it may tend to panic. It may tend to rebel. It may start to assert itself in odd ways. 
Certainly, the confusion that accompanies so many on this awakening journey is a result of the ego wrestling for control and to keep you from being thrust into a world that has been unknown up to this time. Uh, and I would say, too, on a personal note, it, you know, I, it's like the idea of letting go of the ego, the intellect, the analytical part of me, and allowing the squishy, feminine, vulnerable heart to lead. And wow, how scary is that? When I first started on this journey six years ago, I had no, I did not know my heart. I had no idea what it wanted. I had no idea what my heart stood for. I was in this realm of being ruled by ego and by intellect, my critical thinking, all my project management, my planning, this uh, very much, you know, um, corporate world where, you know, all this structure and all this fear kind of rule the day. You know, moving into the heart space, I mean, it took a huge leap for me to get to this point where I could do that and step into the unknown. And I'm over it now, you know, on the other side of this, but I can, I can relate to anybody who's having a hard time. And yeah, the ego tends to act out in really strange ways when it's being faced with, I mean, almost like it's demise, you know, well, if, if anything, it's just a massive change in perception. Okay. And Melky's deck continues here. As humanity begins to be exposed to such concepts, <clears throat> excuse me, as you begin to acclimate collectively to these heightened energies, as consciousness continues to be seeded with information of a new age, trust will begin to build, as will excitement. A pondering, what if? Knowing yourselves in union and in a collective consciousness with your divine selves helping to run the show will help with the much-needed acclimation as you move into the new. It's a really good time for those who are willing and able and who have access to this information to begin to let go of the institutional God as canonized in your scripture for that of self-empowerment, freedom, sovereignty, and collective union. Okay. That's the last sentence here. One more time. It's a really good time for those of us who have access to these messages and to these frequencies and to this knowledge to really start, you know, letting go of any institutionalized feelings, beliefs, thoughts around God and trading that in for self-empowerment, freedom, sovereignty, and collective union. Yeah. So I think most of us are there. I think, you know, we're, this is probably going to be like, yes, we agree. I know this, this feels right. And I'm on that path. So I hope so. And if you're not, um, it's a perfect place for you to be as well, learning all this together through this collective consciousness. So again, thanks for being here. All right, team. Um, I've been posting a few things on our Facebook group. I'm not on Facebook much. I'm not on my computer much. I don't do messenger. Um, but we do have a beautiful group on Facebook. Starseed Lifestyle with Shauna L. Francis, and the link is always in my descriptions here if you want to join that. But I'm putting some uh, some excerpts from the book um, up there, and um, as I've finished the kind of putting together the manuscript for where it's at, and again, this is a, a channeled book with Melchizedek that's really talking mostly about the negative reptilian regime, and kind of, uh, it's like really gearing up for the consciousness outside of our collective to be begin to be seated with this information. So it's kind of the next level out of our group. Um, so, and I, I'd say we're about, sounds like we're about halfway done with the book and I'm really hoping, I mean, I, even this week possibly to start channeling again for the book and getting that ready. And in an ideal world, we're finishing it up by the end of the year. That is my, I don't know if I'm going to make that, if we're going to have time to actually get that done, but that's going to be my goal to get the bulk of this work at least channeled by the end of the year and be publishing early next year. And I really do feel like um, once this book is published, I just, I'd love to get out. I'd love to do some tra traveling, promoting the book. Um, I see myself kind of on a stage and talking about negative reptilians to, who, uh, to people who have never even heard of this concept. Um, we'll see the sparks fly there, but um, I'm quite excited for it. You know, I actually don't know what 2025 is going to bring just yet, but I have these visions. Um, 
Also, I'm going to be putting out another newsletter here soon, and it's going to be more of a personal nature, and I want to be talking a little bit more about what's been going on behind the scenes with Melchizedek and this union. We are a little over two months into this union in, in its current state, and um, yeah, I think it'd just be kind of fun to share some things that are happening behind the scenes. So if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, there's also a link below in the description for that. You can get to all the stuff on my website, seanlfrancis.com. All right. How's everyone doing? I hope well. I hope it's, you're doing amazing. Welcome to fall. Here we are. Um, time's chugging along. I'm excited about the last few months of 2024. I think there's going to be a lot of potential here. And um, yeah, I hope you are too. Okay, team. I love you so much. We'll see you next week. Mwah.